blessings before this wonderful message from my father in the lord late archbishop bensi idaosa i'd like to share information about anointedtube.com with you the number one christian video sharing website today anointedtube.com this is a powerful site believed to be the top most Christian video sharing website in the world today. It is ranked as one of the best video sharing website according to available data. It hosts videos of preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from all around the world. You can as well share our video on all social media platforms. The World Database of Christian Precious, positively touching and changing lives around the world. It is a great Christian video sharing website. The Lord bless you. You can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. Archbishop Benson Idahosa to spend Christmas in prison was the bold caption on the front page of one of the national dailies. All over the city of Benin there was a stir. Those who had only a glimpse of the caption as possessors of the prized newspaper hurried by, headed for the nearest newspaper stands. The vendors saw them pouring in and set in motion the marketing forces of demand and supply. Accordingly, the price of the glorified publication skyrocketed. Other arms of the new media, which observed the boost in sales which the article had accorded the newspaper, determined to cash in on the situation and rushed their reporters to the premises of the law court, from whose proceedings the fertile imagination of journalists had distilled this conclusion. In the weeks that followed, this law court hosted an unprecedented number of news hounds, 
who drank down every sentence which they thought was newsworthy, as learned members of the bench and the bar adjudicated on what came to be the popular contempt case instituted against the Archbishop and Church of God by a few erstwhile senior members of the church. Thereafter, hardly any day passed without newspaper reports on the proceedings in the case. Across the country, cult group members who had stood against the course of the gospel and righteousness congratulated themselves on what they considered their good piece of luck, divinely sent. What? It hosted to go to prison. What 20th century wise Daniels had been the learned counsels in this case? They sought and joined the opponents to whom they paid their 30 pieces of silver in cash and kind. Meanwhile, when a troubled member rushed a copy of the newspaper, which contained what seemed like the impending ruling of the law court to the archbishop, he reacted in a manner quite unforethought. He dismissed it as one of the many lies of the devil which would blow away like an ill wind. Such ill winds had been many. He had taught his admirers that if you remember where you are coming from and you know where you are going, you are not troubled at where you are. He had declared that the numerous trials which had marked his progress in the job of preaching the gospel all over the world had taught him that his trials were growth classes because, as he put it, if you do not build a revelation out of struggle, it may not survive. He said that Christians had been called to battle. As he put it in his own words, you must learn to fight even when you are not willing to fight, because the day you cease fighting, you start losing. As the news spread like a prairie fire, fast and wide, believers poured into the miracle center, and then the prayers began. Like the sound of many waters, the intercession designed to achieve results. In times of trial, people are forced to pray more fervently and with faith too, especially when they believe that outcomes will be determined by their prayers. Thus, what the devil had designed for evil was turned to a blessing, because a mighty revival broke forth and a new generation of fervent prayer warriors was born in the church, and little groups constituted themselves into prayer bands. In the midst of this crisis, the indomitable God-appointed, God-called, and God-anointed man popularly known as Archbishop Benson Idahosa looked at the faces of his grief-stricken wife, the woman of God, now called Mama, and the faces of his troubled church members and made an open declaration whose resounding ripples got to even the ears of the court, which was already priding itself for a job well done. Declare the Archbishop, I cannot go to prison. No court ruling can manage such a feat. If need be, heavens will intervene. Georges and lawyers saw red. They saw a challenge and determined to prove the words of the Archbishop an empty boast. They picked up the gauntlet and the struggle between heaven and hell commenced. <laughs> heaven and the Archbishop won. The court which had boasted that even if it was for a few days it will sentence the archbishop to prison, concluded its ruling as follows. The applicant, litigants which were the plaintiff, is refused in its entirety and is accordingly dismissed with costs in favor of the defendant, respondents assessed at 25 naira. In later years, this high court judge actually became converted and became a Bible student in the All Nations for Christ Bible Institute. It was the early February of 1941 in the ancient city of Benin. Oba Kenzo II was on the traditional throne of his ancestors, having been crowned Oba of Benin eight years before and presented the staff of office of a first-class African king by Lieutenant Governor Buchanan Smith, who was the representative of the British crown in the area. To be installed Oba, this eldest son of Obaiwaka II, known by the complex name of Oko Godfrey Edokba Basimiaweka, had to swear allegiance to His Majesty the British King, as Benin City, and indeed all of what is now Nigeria, was in political subjection to the British Empire, either as colony or as protectorates. 
Benin City, the capital of the ancient and famous kingdom of Benin, had been sacked and burned down by a British punitive expedition on 17 February 1897. Apparently, in retaliation for the massacre of the British Acting Consul General James R. Phillips and his team of officers. The then Obavorame had been captured, tried and deported to Calabar, where he died after 16 years in exile in January 1914. Now there was peace in Benin under the colonial administration. The water rate agitation, spearheaded by the Benin Taxpayers Association, chaired by chiefs Okorotun, the Iyase, Omoui, the Ezomo, and Erbo, the Oshuding, having ended. Pa Johnny Dahosa emerged from behind the mud house, the matchet with which he brushed the light bushes on the tracks to his lumbering site in the forest, in his hands as he moved towards his bicycle, which rested against the wall. He paused for a moment. His junior wife had gone to the market, and none of his three children were around. His fourth child, his fourth child, well, yes, he had heard a few days before that Benson, his sickly fourth child, born on 11 September 1938, who had fled his compound with his mother, Sarah, Pa John's senior wife, was actually thriving. Pa John had ordered that the child be thrown away in order to rid the family of a sickly son whose perennial spells of fainting had become a source of embarrassment to his household. Little did Pa John know that Benson was a child of destiny, destined by God for great things in this kingdom and the kingdoms of the world. For so it came to pass that the young Benson overcame the sickness of his early childhood and grew up a normal African child, living with relatives and helping out as house help in these homes, engaging in animal trapping and hunting, for which cause he sometimes roamed the wilds for days and weeks at a stretch. His was not a very happy early childhood, what with his rejection by his father and the high-handedness with which he was reared in the name of discipline by relatives. But be that as it may, through thick and thin, he had managed to script through an initial Western education in the Salvation Army School Benin City and the Methodist School All War. These had, however, only whetted his appetite for more knowledge. Accordingly, learning by correspondence, he soon obtained a diploma in business administration and a higher diploma in office management, while he worked in Bata Shoe Company, a job which was not to last. Having become a Christian and with a definite knowledge of the Lord through God's extraordinary intervention in his life, he soon had the call of God into the Christian ministry. In his search for proper equipment for the work of the ministry, he worked for and obtained certificates, diplomas, and associate degrees from several institutions, including Igbaja Bible College, Nigeria, and Christ for the National Institute, Dallas, Texas, USA. Having been honored by many renowned institutions of higher learning, the Right Reverend Dr. Benson Idahosa had become the most illustrious of the children of Pa John and Mama Sarah Idahosa, both of whom passed over to the great beyond before they could see the glory of the sun that constituted a cause of separation between them. The ways of the Lord are beyond human understanding. Under God's guidance and encouragement, the pastor Benson Idahosa founded the Church of God Mission International, having been tried most rigorously in the Christian ministerial crucible. The refiner's fire took in the form of numerous challenges within and without the church and family, and the several court cases, among which was a famous contempt of court case here. He had emerged as the Archbishop of Church of God Mission International Incorporated, the president and founder of the All Nations for Bible Institute, the president and founder of Idahosa World Outreach, a father and counselor to numerous Christian ministries, an ambassador extraordinary of the Kingdom of Christ, an executive member of the College of Bishops of the International Charismatic Churches, a preacher, born to preach and happy to preach. Said he, the fulfilled ambition that has offered me the deepest spiritual satisfaction in life is the power to overcome temptation, because not many who were insulted accused and fought, as I have been, have stood their grounds and not lost sight of their vision. Married to Reverend Dr. Mrs. Margaret Idahosa, the Archbishop, had four biological children, among whom is the now Reverend Feb Idahosa II, 
the first and only son in the family. All the children are following the footsteps of their father in the desire to know more about God, serve him, and demonstrate that Jesus is alive. Reverend Dr. Mrs. Margaret Idahosa has succeeded her husband as head of Church of God Mission International Incorporated and Chancellor of Benson Idahosa University, while Reverend Feb Idahosa II presently serves as president of the university. In discussing some of his experiences, the Archbishop had the following to say. I was found in fire his boat. Everything about me, bed, place, time, when, how, why, I all in fire his boat. But in a nutshell, I'm born to the Ezomos family of Benin City uh, by the late Idahosa. And uh, my grandfather's name was Idahosa, my father's name Idahosa. They bought their individual names before the house. When I found, when I got saved, the meaning of my grandfather's name, the house means I'm attentive to God. I decided to adopt that as my foremost name, even though my other names are Benson, Ayoma, Andrew, before the house. When the Lord spoke to me about television ministry, I decided to request the Nigerian government for airtime. Accordingly, I sent my secretary to request for airtime on the Nigerian Television Authority station. The manager of programs, a lady, ridiculed her and hollered, Who is Benson Dahosa and what is his Christian program? He has no business with the government and television is not for religious purposes. With indignation, he rushed for his car and drove to the television headquarters and asked to see the lady. When she knew who her visitor was, she did not grant him audience for an hour and 12 minutes. When she finally opened her door, the Archbishop went straight to the point. Did you tell my secretary that the Lord Christ has no place on the Nigerian government television network? Yes, she affirmed. Then I'm dismissing you from your position as the personnel in charge of the television programming, he informed her. You, she asked incredulously, what are you in the government? To arrogate such a power to yourself what is your position in government he said my government does not operate from the earth it operated from heaven if you do not allow the gospel of jesus christ on government television i will remove you from your position he said and left now nobody knew what happened between heaven and hell but three days later government auditors discovered the loss of 391,000 nigerian pounds from the coffers of the television station and they determined that this lady was responsible for the loss. She was dismissed and six months of her back salary confiscated. The dismissal was announced on the same government television. When the Archbishop saw what had happened, he rushed to the television ministry headquarters and went straight to the chairman of the board. What kind of replacement are you considering for the dismissed lady? The Archbishop asked him. We have decided on an honest Christian young man, he answered. The young man in question was to resume duties at 9 o'clock the next morning. At 11.30 a.m. the next day, the Archbishop was at the television station knocking at the door of this new officer in charge of programs. After the usual pleasantries, he went straight to the point. You must realize that I placed you in this position, he told him. Did you know that four days ago I was here to place the gospel on the government television and your predecessor refused? The man sat listening. I therefore removed her by my God-given authority, he continued. And if you stand in the way of God's gospel on the government television, I will not hesitate to ask the Lord to remove you tomorrow. The man sat there looking at him with surprise and question marks all over his countenance. Did you say you removed her from position, he asked. Yes, the Archbishop said. Four days ago I removed her and now you are here. It is in your interest to allow the gospel of the Lord Jesus on this television station to tell the marvelous gospel of Jesus Christ. That's all right, the man said. Get us your videotapes for the broadcast as quickly as you can. Now, the archbishop said, I have no videotapes. No videotapes? None. Can we produce the program for you, he asked. That would be a great honor, the archbishop said. Then bring your choir to the studio. A few days later... The church choir and the archbishop spent three hours at the government television studio producing a Christian television special, which they called the Redemption Hour. Miracle Center to Go Down 
was a sensational new headline on several daily newspapers of that day. Later, when the television carried it as part of the late evening news, it sounded like music to the ears of the ungodly. By early 1976, the Church of God Mission had completed another big and beautiful church building in Nigeria. The building was named Miracle Center. It is a center that has witnessed the mighty hands of God in action. Hundreds and thousands of people have confessed Christ as Lord and Savior in that building, and countless thousands have received physical healing under its roof. Millions have been reached with the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ through the Christian television programs, which were recorded during church services held in the building. And thousands have testified of physical healings as they touched the television sets as points of contact when the Archbishop prayed in the television programs recorded in the building and its environs. Die-hard criminals have been transformed into saints in the building. The mighty power of the Holy Ghost had been recorded among worshippers of the living God in the building. On April 6, 1976, the then federal government of Nigeria announced that the church building was too close to the airport. And that for that reason, the church building, the Miracle Center, would be pulled down. Miracle Center to go down. Saints and sinners were shocked. But while saints were moved to holy indignation by the shock, sinners clapped, sang, and danced for joy. The church gave the matter much consideration. It was true that the church was close to the Benin airport. But what type of nuisance did it constitute to airport operations? The church could think of none. A popular complaint against Pentecostal churches in this part of the world was that they were noisy and people pointed to the loud rhythmic chorus singing, the trumpet blasts and crashing cymbals as evidence of their complaints. However, the airport authority could not lay such a complaint because no so-called noise from the church could be in any way comparable to the noise of aircrafts landing or taking off. If the reason for the proposed demolition of the church building was because of the authorities' intention to expand the airport runway. There was a Nigerian Air Force barracks, which was separated from the church premises only by a street of 10 to 15 feet wide. If the expansion of the airport could be maneuvered away from the Air Force barracks, it could also be done for the medical center. A possible reason for the proposed demolition could also have been the height of the medical center church building vis-a-vis -vis the landing and taking off operations of aircrafts. But again, the church reasoned that this could not be a tenable reason because the height of the medical center was nothing compared to the height of the Air Force telecommunication mast, which was located in the neighboring Air Force barracks. One reason which the church thought could be the masking reason behind all the complaints was that the enemies of the gospel did not want the banner of Christ in form of a church building to confront visitors and users of the airport. They possibly did not want anything Christian close to the airport. Accordingly, the church decided that the medical center should not be pulled down, although a federal military government had so decreed. On the Sunday following the federal government's announcement, worshippers came to the medical center with heavy hearts and apprehension. On that Sunday, the Archbishop climbed and stood on top of the pulpit and from that height and precarious position, he announced that the medical center would not go down. He said, instead, those who desire its fall will go down. He made the same announcements on radio and television during the usual Christian airtime programs. The head of state said, how would he do it? The archbishop said, I pray to God. The miracle center building is still standing today and still a much celebrated center of worship. Before the Archbishop was given a commission by the law to preach, there was a notorious secret cult in Benin City, and indeed much of Bendel and the western states of Nigeria, which exacted much influence on the lives of the people. It was the reformed Ogboni confraternity. At that time, you could not be promoted in a government ministry or parastatal unless you were a member of the cult. Your boss and indeed most prominent men in the area were members. You could not easily win a legal suit in a court of law against a criminal because the magistrate or judge, as well as the culprit, were members of the secret cult. The case file would be missing, and in any case, the prosecuting police officer who was a member of the secret cult would ensure that relevant documents and evidence did not exist to any secret cult culprit a prison sentence. 
You could not even engage in a private and legitimate pursuit if you were not a member of the court. By threats of death and other such arm-twisting methods, they operated like a crude mafia organization seeking to control the whole of society. Honesty and justice in society were near strangulation. Then, under the direction of the Lord God Almighty, the Archbishop stepped into the situation. He began to condemn the cult from the pulpit, on television, on the pages of newspaper, and every other available media. Immediately, there were angry outbursts, insults, cursings, and the threats to his life. But he continued undaunted. On several occasions, there were planned ambushes and assassination attempts against him. But the Lord God, who is the Most High, kept him alive as he followed his direction. Gradually, the result began to come. Many prominent members of the cult began to renounce their membership and to surrender their insignia of the wicked organization. On a particular day, the Archbishop was in his little office in the then headquarters church when visitors were announced. And guess who they were? A top delegation of the cult members, including a former chief judge of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. To see him and into his office, they all crowded. Then the former chief judge, who was the leader of the delegation, addressed him on the reason for their coming. Pastor Benson, he said, you've been a good boy and we're proud of what you're doing. We also want to give you a staunch support. We will, from henceforth, pay for all of your television airtime. The Archbishop's heart skipped a bit. What a proposal. But you must promise us one thing. Here it comes, he thought. You must from this day stop preaching against our cult. You may not praise us, but just stop your verbal onslaught against us, and you will no longer have to worry about your TV airtime. Be a good boy. A little shakily, the Archbishop said, I've heard what you said, but before I give you my reply, let us pray. They consented and went on their knees. Lord, we commit this situation into your hands, he prayed. Now, you foul demons, you occultic spirits, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I arrest you and I charge you, come out in the name of Jesus. Come out in the name of Jesus. Come out! They got up from their knees, blinking in indignation. Then what have we been discussing, they demanded. Why did we have to come to see this boy? Who would have thought that this stubbornness could go this far? At the end, they all filed out of the little office, promising the Archbishop a hard time. The state police headquarters was a beehive of activities as usual. Officers and men could be seen strutting in the premises. Their guns carried lightly in the generally relaxed atmosphere. Cars were racing in and out as a civilian population in the state who had one palaver or the other to clear with the law came in for their businesses. A uniformed man stepped out of the door leading to a staircase of one of the numerous story buildings on the premises. And suddenly, policemen began to snap at attention and give smart salutes as the man, barely acknowledging their greetings, walked briskly to a police car parked in a garage. The car was opened by an orderly who had been following him. The man entered the car, and the orderly lightly closed the car door and saluted. Then he hurried to the other side and got onto the front seat beside the driver's seat, which was already occupied by another uniformed policeman. The car's engine came to life, and the car shot out of the premises with wailing sirens and flashing beacons. Then the atmosphere in the premises became relaxed once more. The man, the police officer, and the car who was actually police commissioner, was visibly agitated. In all his years in the police force, he had never received worse news. But how could it have happened? When a few days before, he had seen the reverend gentleman about whom he had just received the news, the man had been as hale and hearty as ever. That was one of the things he liked about him. Apart from the sound evidence of the presence of the Holy Spirit and the power of God in the reverend gentleman's life, his sense of humor was amazing. You could never get him to be anxious about anything. There was no situation, no matter how dangerous it may be, that he could not talk light-heartedly about. And now this news. What? The Reverend Benson and the are dead. Unbelievable. Unimaginable. No, 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 no. What a death. What a blow at this time of the nation's development. He could still remember him clearly. The boyish face, the athletic build, 
the business-like strides, he had gone to him several times to seek counsel in the heat, which was often generated by his responsibilities, both as police commissioner, as a Christian, and as a family. And every time, without exception, he had left the reverend's home feeling that the end of the world for him at least had not come. Who could fill such a vacuum? Here was a fearless young man with the obvious fire and zeal of the Most High God burning in his bones. A man who was a veritable pillar of Christianity in the country. A man who has a voice, indeed a Christian voice, in the midst of a nation on the brink of major decisions. This was no time to die. And his wife, what would she do? Together they had stood for the cause of the gospel in this part of the world. Ah, and the children. He snapped out of his reverie as a car came to a halt in front of the Reverend B. A. E. Dahosa's home. He climbed out with understandable apprehension. How would he confront the man's family? But then he observed that no morning crowd was anywhere visible in the premises. These people's view of life, he thought, was almost bordering on eccentricity. The family might just be keeping the sad news to themselves. What a nerve! He could not hear even a sniff, talk more of wailing and crying. With a trembling hand, he pressed the doorbell and waited. There was a click as the key was turned, and the door was opened inwards. And there, standing by the door, was a ghost. The police officer was stunned, and fought hard to resist the urge to flee. He just stared, for standing by the door was no other person than the Reverend Benson in Dahosa himself, and with the usual welcoming smile and all. The Archbishop looked hard at his friend, the Commissioner, for a while, and wondered why he looked scared out of his wits. I thought you were... well, uh, they said you were dead, the commissioner managed to say. Myself? Dead? The archbishop was shocked, but then he quickly recovered. Yes, of course, he said. I was dead, but I came back to life yesterday. He laughed and invited him in. Later, as he listened to his friend's story and the grief which his kind heart had felt for nothing, the archbishop knew that the enemies of the gospel had again tried, in vain of course, You can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. some dangerous mischief and thought they had succeeded this time. Having considered the matter, the Archbishop decided that the enemy made a mistake. My Bible tells me that no weapon formed against me shall prosper and that every tongue that shall rise against me in judgment I shall condemn. Isaiah 54 verse 17. 
he further said, and that is what the Bible is telling you too. As long as you are in Christ, you are indestructible. However, you must know that you are in a battle all the time, fighting the good fight of faith. The good fight of faith is one that always turns out good, no matter the element of surprise which the enemy springs. In the end, you emerge victorious. The trumpet signifying the end of the battle will not be blown until you are winning. Professor Don Petrie of the Oral Roberts University was an educationist of high repute with this university. Because of his initial interest and foundational work in Benson Idahosa University, he was in the past referred to as the university's international vice chancellor. He had helped to build a few universities in some parts of the world, and the Lord had told him that his work was not over, as he will build another one by the name of Christian Faith University. He did not know where that would finally be located, but he had expected to be involved with it some day. He went into a supermarket in the United States of America one day and found on a bookstand a little volume with the title of Fire in His Bones. Leafing through it, he saw that it was the biography of an African preacher by the name of Benson Edahosa. He had never heard of the man. He had bought the book, and on reading it, he saw that God had told this man, Benson Edahosa, to build a university, and that the name of the institution would be Christian Faith University. His God-given dream, University. Immediately, he began to make inquiries about the whereabout of this Benson Edahosa. He finally succeeded in obtaining his telephone number, and he called. The excitement which the man on the other side of the line exhibited, and his own excitement, was mutual. Not very long after, they both were able to meet, and together they discussed Christian Faith University. On his part, although the idea of a private university in Nigeria was a novelty, and he did not know of what form the university would take, the Archbishop had, on hearing from the Lord that he would build a university for his glory, acquired a wide expanse of land, which he named University Site. This site was a stretch of land which was traditionally forbidden for human habitation, as it contained about a hundred traditional shrines, with trees, many of which were over 300 years old. It was an evil forest, with numerous shrines of the royal house located there. However, the Archbishop had acquired it because in a vision God had shown to him this beautiful house situated right on top of a protestant devil on this very expanse of shrine studded expanse of land. By way of preparation, the Archbishop had helped a deacon in the Church of God mission, now Reverend Dr. John Okoya, a lecturer in the University of Benin, to proceed to Oral Roberts University on sabbatical to understudy the workings of a Christian private university and to sensitize the international community on the proposed Christian Faith University. This was the state of affairs when on the 5th of August 1992, the Lord God woke the Archbishop up at 4 a.m. and said, I told you that I will take you around the world, and that I have done, and I'm still doing. I told you that I will build through you a Bible school for all nations, and I have done so. I told you that I would open for you the avenue to preach my word on television, and I'm doing just that. I told you that I will build a miracle center for the glory of my name, and have done so. I told you that I will build a hospital for mercy and evangelism, and I have done so. Now I am telling you to build a university, and I will surely see it come to pass. And the people to help carry out this vision have already been called out. The next day he began the implementation of what the Lord had told him. Under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, he called three men who were active already in the ministry and unburdened this vision of the night. The three were the now Reverend Professor John Okoya, Reverend Professor Vincent Iyawe, and Reverend Michael J. Okagbari. He told them that although the vision was given to him, the execution of the project will be the responsibility of the three. Having met, these three constituted the nucleus of the pioneering committee whose work and plan had led to the establishment of the Christian Faith University, Institute of Continuous Learning. Between the three of them, they had invited all other members of the pioneering committee, some of whom had continued as functionaries in the university and its council. 
The then Reverend Dr. John Okoya was chairman. Reverend Dr. Vincent Iyawe was an executive member, while Deacon Michael Okagbari was the executive secretary. Later, when the pioneering committee broke into different subcommittees, the now Professor Mrs. Uche Benedio became the chairman of the academic subcommittee. It was a wonder that soon after the Archbishop made his intention to establish a private university known to the then military government of Nigeria, it set up a machinery to review the legal instrument banning the establishment of private universities in the country. And this exercise ended with the amendment of this edict and the Standing Committee on Private University Unit was established at the National University Commission under the chairmanship of Mr. Ajayi of the legal department. Having submitted the necessary application for the university to the National Universities Commission, the pioneering committee prepared for the telling of the sod ceremony, which held on September 12, 1992. In the opening speech on the occasion, the Archbishop said, Hallelujah! This is the day about which the Lord God spoke, for you hold in your hands information concerning the first steps towards the fulfillment of a vision of many years ago, a vision which relates to our world of education and intellectual development. This vision has crystallized into a name, the Christian Faith University. An institution of such socio-structural height in the private sector in present-day Nigeria may seem far-fetched, and initially I had my worries about its possibility. But over the years, the Lord has constantly affirmed that before he gives a vision, he has already laid the blueprints for its fulfillment. In other words, when God gives a vision and commission, he makes provision. From the mandate which the Archbishop got from the Lord God, he stated his vision for the university in clear and uncertain terms. Thus, my vision in education is for the sole and express purpose of glorifying God and His Son Jesus Christ through the operation of a Christian post-secondary institution dedicated to the education of students in spiritual maturity, academic excellence, and physical wholeness. Furthermore, we seek to establish a climate of free scholastic inquiry, provide direction whereby students may learn of God's revealed truths, and develop Christian leaders and professionals who shall have high ethical and moral standards and be responsive to God's word and spirit. Benson Idahosa University, BIU, would be an institution which would be new from the start, but coming out of the ancient principles of the Bible, yet with a strong emphasis on strong academics, so that although the Bible is its main book, it will be fully accredited as an institution of higher learning. The entire process would absolutely require us to be on the cutting edge of what was new and proven in educational circles but ancient enough to stand on the eternal foundations of the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit and God's authority. It can be done only if we believed, if we worked, if we stand uncompromisingly, if we trust God as our source, and if we want to do it badly enough. Emphasis is more on the quality of students rather than the quantity. This also related to the development of campuses. Quality rather than quantity is the emphasis. Manpower development is the objective, and it will be a university where quality of education overrides quantity. While public universities annually turn out thousands of graduates who roam the streets with their degrees for lack of jobs, we intend to turn out every year graduates with professional careers who will have jobs already waiting for them before they graduate. In my travels all over the world, I've seen university campuses on single seven-floor buildings producing graduates in various disciplines, such as law, medicine, engineering, agriculture, education, and the like. Ours will be a university where students and faculty will be a gift to their generation. Thus, while we recognize that huge campus development is needful, we shall use resources as they come to provide functional facilities. Doing great things with little, said the Archbishop. When we laid the foundation of the Medical Center, I had only $120 to start the project. When the Faith Medical Center was to be built, I had only $514 to begin the project. And now that I have $1,000, the Lord is telling me that now is the time to start the Benson Idahosa University. For 11 years, 
the Bentony Dahosa University has remained a matured vision inside of me, and I'm happy that the time for its birth has come. Together, let us take unto ourselves the labor pains for an institution that will change the destiny of individuals, societies, and nations. The Lord God has told me that this project, which He has committed into our hands, will outlive us, and generations yet unborn will remember us for what we are about to do. The following were the pioneering committee members. Rev. Dr. John Okoya, Rev. Dr. Vincent Iyawe, Deacon Michael Okagbari, Rev. Wuni Ogundili, Dr. Ia Pofuri Taigbenu, Deacon Dr. Daniel Ihu Omaregbe, Deacon V. A. Aladishelu, Elder M. I. Igelike, Rev. Dr. S. O. Ehigiato, Deaconess Pat Donga, Dr. Mrs. Yubi Gbenedio, Deaconess Leibo Igelike. The philosophy behind the vision of the Benson Idahosa University was as follows. We live in a world today where the devil has tried to make people believe that our is unreasonable and is not academically and intellectually tenable. As God's people, we stand to prove that God is the author of knowledge and his children must therefore combine godly spirituality with academic and intellectual excellence. In our secular educational systems, Students are taught philosophies which pervert the truth to the detriment of the sacred biblical principles of godliness and holy living. To counteract and undermine these devilish philosophies, the Benson Idahosa University will provide to students the conducive milieu to learn that true knowledge and all science, properly so called, is for the glory of God and for the service of humanity. And this we will achieve by the dissemination of professional and academic knowledge with a background of biblical and charismatic theology. Thus, the Benson Idahosa University will utilize biblical principles to purify the vital aspects of human culture, which easily fall prey to and become tools of the devil. These areas include food, agriculture, business, health, medicine, and the mass media. The university will commence with the four colleges of theology and liberal arts, agriculture, health sciences, and mass media, and business. The Benson Idahosa University intends to transcend the traditional threefold purposes of education. A, the acquisition of knowledge, B, improvement upon knowledge, and C, the transfer of knowledge to future generations. To a fourth dimension, that of providing an education that will concurrently develop students' minds, their bodies, and their spirits. The academic programs of the Benson Idahosa University will be designed to provide an atmosphere of spiritual freedom, which will help students to discover the truth about and the way to personal salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of the Christian faith. This is the necessary antecedent which the Lord Holy Spirit, the other comforter, requires to reorient and reintegrate the total being of the beneficiaries of the BIU programs and to give unto them power from on high, which alone can give their human spirits the necessary dominion over their mental and physical processes. This is the key to true individual self-actualization. Thus, humanly fulfilled, they can wade into a world which is eagerly waiting for redirection and enlightenment. This is the goal of the Benson Idahosa University. Later that year, with a handful of faithfuls and supporters, the Archbishop laid the foundation of the first building, the prominent bungalow block, which today houses offices, the lecture theater, and several classrooms. On the 27th of April, 1994, the first group of about 45 students came into residence and lectures began. The academic director was Dr. Daniel Ikuo Moregbe, while the registrar director of administration was Deacon Michael Okagbari, under the presidency of the Archbishop and the directive of the pioneering committee. On 4th June 1994, the Christian Faith University Institute of Continuous Learning held its first matriculation ceremony. At the matriculation ceremony of 1996, the Archbishop spelt out the expected behavior of the students of the university. We are giving you the foundation and now we give you the high rise. And I hope you write that down in your life. What we are giving you is the, the vision with the foundation. But the high rise will depend on what you make out of what you have been taught 
I believe this message is blessing you. Please visit and share videos on anointedtube.com, the world database of Christian preachers, to help us reach 100 million people. The message continues after this video about anointed tube. You can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now.
hundred the men beginning from 12th of February will be different from what you are seeing now. Anybody entering this campus must have a reason of coming. They cannot just come and pick you with hands. Those of you that have come from background of do what you like, you have entered the school, you cannot do what you like, you do what you are told. I hope you are hearing what I'm saying. Don't just think we woke up one day to say we want to establish a Christian university. When we call it Christian University, it's different from Owebe University. Wow. It's different from Ohio University. It's different from Federal Government University. It's different from State Government University. We are not UNESCO, we are not UNIFE, we are not Unified, we are CFPU. Yeah. Best yeah. and foremost is Christian life in academic excellence in government. Yeah. It's our yeah. one of three. On the presentation from the panel, the station panel came here. The commendation they made of us when this was not even like this. Only eternity can take that of our heart. With the way they commended us, it took Unipen 15 years to get to where we are now in two years. It has taken it for 30 years to be where they are. It has taken you lot of me about 50 years this year to be where they are. We will be what God wants us to be in a very short time. So, I want to seriously warn you, not only a high or warn you, and this is not a celebration of the election. No of campus faith. No I hope you are hearing me. You girl. And we are going to tell you the type of hair you can be having in this school. You cannot just carry all the ropes in the market and put on your head. You must be a student. And you cannot be in this school. Not having a group you belong to in the church. It's a Christian school. If you want to go to Sugar, it's there. You want to go to Ife, it's there. But you want to attend this one, discipline is the key word. No boy here can smoke or drink. And no student in, the university, in our university can have beer. For the four years, you shave clean. You look at my own, no he good, no she good, no brother good. <laughs> Neat and clean. We don't have boys that bring coke to be combing their beer. No, and then no shirt without body. You don't open your chest down. You lock your body. I'm going to, when you are resuming, you will know the type of person that you have. And the reason I'm saying this to you is because that's what I do to my own children. None of my four children is wayward. Besides the millions I have all over the world, they are taught the best discipline. You have to be one of my children in the Lord. Yeah. You're coming to this school automatically make you one of my children. The same care I take for my own children, I will take about you. And then you don't paint your finger like vulture. You are hearing me? Yeah. You are going to paint your mouth, paint it neatly. Don't paint it like somebody who is on the street. Good lipstick, good eye play. Not just all you put down the road, put on the head. <laughs> all right. We are ready for this. This is on the back of the I'm not the person that just tell you Matthew said, Paul said. I'm telling you what current events say. And the daily life that will make you a better tomorrow, a citizen in the, in the city that can be proud of anywhere in the world. Wherever you appear, you say I'm from CFU, people dug their heart for you. In less than five years from now, people will be begging us to loan them our students to work for them in banks and different corporations. Yeah. That's my question. So you have a very big vital part to play. That is for you to face the purpose for your coming here. In 1962, the Archbishop was 24, a tall and lanky young man, open to society and insane influence. 
But instead of following other young people, he prepared for the Christian ministry. In the midst of that society, young people can be clean and make a difference. Noah was an example. In 1959, the Archbishop had enrolled as a correspondence student with the London Bennett Correspondence College. His career, personality and the picture above had won the heart of Margaret, now Right Reverend Mrs. M. E. Idahosa. And who would not have fallen for a young man like this one? Look at the photograph again. The contemporary fashion of a path in the hair called I don't care, notwithstanding he was a gentleman through and through. Then Margaret, now Mama, sent her picture to him and their friendship started. This was followed by another one and then they took one together. It finally ended in a holy wedlock on April 6th, 1969. After the wedding, a year went by, and Margaret did not conceive a baby. She is an only child, and the family anxiously awaited word that a baby was on the way, and the word did not come. They saw the help of a gynecologist who, after many tests, said that Margaret had an internal heat condition that would never permit her to have children. And the Archbishop set the scriptures and concluded that they would have children. And in the fourth year after their marriage, faith paid off and their first baby was born on 22nd December 1972 and was christened Faith Emmanuel Benson, or Feb for short. Here is Feb celebrating his third birthday anniversary in London. Meanwhile, the Archbishop grew in the spirit and in his call in the ministry. He started a prayer meeting which met in a little storefront building and he started crusades. Signs and wonders accompanied his ministry and he established the first church at Yarrow Beninsity. The second was Miracle Center and then the Faith Arena. The ministry attracted important gospel luminaries like Dr. T.L. Osborne and Dr. Richard Roberts. He was invited to address congresses, executive councils, parliaments, kings, presidents, prime ministers, heads of states and other important dignitaries the world over as with President Ibrahim Babangida, retired Nigerian head of state Olusegun Obasanjo, then Omonoba A. Diawa. Before he passed on, he had taken the gospel to more than 150 countries. He had visited every part of the globe and preached in every continent of the world. It was March 1998. It was a busy period at the headquarters of Church of God Mission International Incorporated. The Archbishop had returned from one of his many tours and was home. Members of the Oral Roberts University Educational Fellowship, ORWEF, were the headquarters of Word of Faith group of schools for the yearly ORWEF program. They were led by Professor Don Petri, a friend of the Benson Idahosa University, and a professor of Christian education at the Oral Roberts University. Both he and all the American participants at the conference were guests at the Archbishop's home. It was early afternoon, and the Archbishop and his guests were at table. The characteristic humor of the Archbishop, eliciting laughter and chatter, punctuated the lunch. It was a sumptuous meal, and both local and international guests were satisfied. Then a fruit juice was passed around in packets, on which were printed the brand name Pure Heaven. The caption started another round of conversation. It was about heaven. Then suddenly there was a hush as the Archbishop broke into the good-natured conversation and asked, How many of you are ready to go to heaven right now? Something about his countenance, as he asked the question, demanded seriousness and sobriety. The hush continued. You see, he continued, all Christians talk about heaven, its beauty, and its desirability, but not one is prepared to go there straight away. I have news for you. I'm prepared to go to heaven right now. Anyone going with me? Everyone was silent. The mood of the diners changed and became reflective and sober. This was the atmosphere in the Archbishop's home as they rose from the meal and went to their rooms. The Archbishop called for Professor Don Petri to join him in one of the many sitting rooms in the mansion and spread on a table before them the master plan of the now Benson Idahosa University. He indicated those aspects of the master plan which he had implemented and requested the professor to continue from where he was ending. Yet, 
Professor Dom Petri did not understand the meaning of the Archbishop's words. The Archbishop seemed an epitome of vivacity, wholesomeness, and well-being. It could not have entered the mind of anybody that, like Elijah of old, he would be translated a few minutes after. For so it was that while he yet spoke, instructing the deaconess caterer about what the guests should eat for dinner, he threw his head back on the easy chair and gave up the ghost. Professor Tom Petrie did not immediately understand until he saw the body slumping off the chair. Then Don Petrie rushed at him, calling for help and laying him on the rug carpet. He tried all the resuscitation techniques which he knew, but to no avail. The call for help from the fifth mediplex, but the doctors testified that from the moment he heaved that sigh of relief, he had clearly departed. His going had an air of finality, which the doctors knew but could not admit. They bundled the body on a stretcher and carried it to the fifth mediplex, but thinking better of the issue, they took it back home. Archbishop Benson at Dahosa, the undisputed prophet and apostle of Christendom in the 20th century, was gone. He had stood out the voice of Christ in Nigeria, and till today no other has been able to fill his place. He was a leader whose influence transcended denominational and religious barriers. Today there are Christian leaders whose concerns are only for the cycle of their denominations. He was honored both by the high and low in society. Presidents, governors paid him night visits to seek counsel, while luminaries of other religions feared the God he served. By the time of his coronation, he possessed a Master of Church Administration degree. He was Professor Consultant. He, he was Professor de Philosophie Evangelique from the International University Brussels, Belgium. He had a Doctor of Laws degree from Oral Roberts University, Tulsa, Oklahoma. He was a life member of the Bible Society of Nigeria. He was a member of the International Ministerial Association for Community Concerns in Washington, D.C., USA. He had a certificate of membership of International Evangelical Church and Missionary Association. He was a certified member of the World Prayer Group in Dallas, Texas, USA. He was an executive member of the World Council of Churches. He was the Chairman Board of Trustees of Church of God Mission International Incorporated. He was an executive member of the College of Bishops of Charismatic Churches. He was a President of All Nations for Christ Bible Institute. He was President of Idahosa World Outreach. He was member of the International Evangelical Church and Missionary Association. He was Executive Council member of Christian Association of Nigeria, CAN. He was Executive Council member of the British Society of Commerce, Nigeria. He had a Certificate of Commendation from Detroit City Council, USA, for outstanding evangelical work. He had a Certificate of Recognition of the Full Gospel Fellowship of Churches and Ministers International. He had a Special Tribute from the State of Michigan, USA. He was an honorary citizen of Loves Park, Illinois, USA. He was patron British Society of Commerce, Nigeria. He was an honorary fellow British Society of Commerce, Nigeria. He was an honorary citizen of the city of Albuquerque, New Mexico. He was a regent of the Oral Roberts University, Tulsa, Oklahoma, USA. He was international honorary vice chairman, Charismatic Bible Ministries, CBM. He was an associate regent, Bethel Christian College and Bethel Graduate School of Theology, Riverside, California, USA. He was, he was so many more. He was Archbishop. You can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. 
We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. Idausa is my father. My first encounter with uh, Archbishop Idausa, he was doing a big crusade uh, in the center of Accra, which is called Circle. He said, if your faith say yes, God cannot say no. Idausa is a man that believe with God, all things are possible. He had an unwavering faith. He had an unshaking faith. He had an unbreaking faith. He had faith in God. He saw God as he's talking to a faithful father. He saw God like his son will see a father who he trusts that is faithful. Whatever I ask my daddy to do, he will do it. That was Idausa's level of faith, beyond man's uh, explanation. He had faith. Spiritual, a person, yet he was so human in nature. A man who reached out to everyone, the high, and the law in society. A man who rubs shoulders with presidents and the highest of dignitaries you can think of in society. I feel very blessed because the Lord has called me to preach the word of God in Africa and particularly in Nigeria. Um, I've been here with my husband 40 years now. It, it's a blessing. And it's particularly been a blessing to work with Papa Idahosa and Mama Idahosa. When you talk about legacy, I remember traveling with Archbishop Idahosa to Kaduna for the consecration of Bishop Oyedepo. I think it's Faith Liberation Chapel. I remember it as if it is today. And uh, Archbishop said, we are going. And when we got to Benin Airport, uh, Okada, uh, that's chief, Igbenidion had given him an aircraft. So we flew from Benin City Airport to Kaduna. And I carried, and it was there he told me in the preach, he said, This is my son. At the point, at that time, I didn't really know Bishop Edipo. This must have been early in the 80s or something. And then, many, a couple of weeks after, Bishop Edipo came to me. Church of God Mission, Sunday evening service. And I remember the first message he preached, it was on the prodigal son. The man brought me out from the dungeon. Papa Idahosa was, he was a man full of 
energy and vision. Uh, he, he, he was always getting, uh, moving on from one project to another. And often when he started a new project, we whites, we or we boys would say, why is he doing that? We couldn't see the vision at all. We thought, hmm, this is very funny. But then sometime later we would realize, oh yes, okay, I see why he's done that now. And I was a Muslim that I gave my life to Christ. In Ghana, there was this kind of freedom of worship. There were a lot of Muslims. And among those people that were the grace of God, I gave my life to Christ. And I wanted to go to Bible school when I felt the call of God upon my life. And unfortunately for me, at that particular time, with the Assemblies of God Ghana, there was no space for women to go to Bible school. So my pastor called me and said, he wants me to go to Nigeria and meet with Indahosa because there is a room in that particular ministry for women. And I traveled to Nigeria by the grace of God. On getting there, I met with the Archbishop, my first time of meeting the Archbishop in Dahosa of Church of God Mission International. What an awesome privilege it was to see this man of faith and boldness. I will never forget the Unicha Crusade. At that time, the head of state in Nigeria had passed the law that nobody should do open air crusades. And Archbishop said he went to pray and said, God, God, what they are saying, and God asked him, what do you want? He said, I want to do crusade. God said, go ahead and do your crusade. So he sent us, I was part of the uh, advanced team, to go and paste posters all over Odicha. And we went to put posters all over Odicha. And the first day of the crusade, a truckload of soldiers came. The man of faith, the man of prayer, the man of courage, the man of peace. And Archbishop mounted the platform. And, and the soldiers came with their guns. When Archbishop started preaching, they all put their guns down. When he made the altar call, they all raised their hands to receive Jesus as Lord and personal savior. And we stood there and the whole crusade was an eye opener for us. And right there, I decided I needed to go and know more from this man. Fortunately, he was offering scholarship for people who want to attend Bible school in Benin, All Nation for Christ Bible Institute. And so that particular year, I uh, requested, I wrote, and fortunately, I was invited to come. So uh, we went to Nigeria to begin. Uh, my class, Actually, I went there in 79. My class started in 1980. And uh, we went through the Bible training, and it was powerful. We were all charged up. He started uh, the Word of Faith schools. He started the Christian Hospital, Faith Mediplex. He started Benson Eder Hose university all those and well he's he's a man we can't we can't forget he was a great example to us and i thank god it's particularly good for us whites british because in britain uh people are rather skeptical these days You'll not find many people who are really born again Christians. Um, people of faith are few in Britain, but if we can come here and our faith can be uh, increased, can be inspired, particularly by the things that Papa did, we are blessed. Let me share this. And I think for those who were around in Church of God Mission at that time, we traveled to Washington for Jesus. John Geminis went to Baltimore flew to New York, and then flew to Lagos on Nigeria with 11 hours. And then we took Okada from Okada Air from Lagos to Benin City. It was bad weather. Brother, it was one turbulence I, I told God, as long as I'm alive, never let me face anything like this again in my travel. I'm sure Dausa and the wife Margaret 
were in the first class, which is only divided by a curtain, because it's a 90 seater plane. And we took off from Lagos to Benin. It was bad weather, raining cats and dogs. We rented a storm. There were Filipino pilots. And then they said that he has lost contact. The pilot said, listen, he has lost contact with Lagos. And so he doesn't know where he is. That is ridiculous. You are supposed to be taking us to Benin. So if you, the pilot, has lost contact and you don't know where you are and it's raining cats and dogs, what do you want us to do? And when I looked through the hood, brother, I was sitting at the edge of my seat like this. I was shaking in my boots. I'd never been scared like that. I thought I was, I, it, it was a life and death situation. The plane will lose, dive, turn left, turn right. When I looked through the curtain, I was looking at the reaction of the Abishoy Daosa. He was saying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And then one time he stood up in the aircraft, lifted his hand. I will never forget. He said, God, this is what he said. God, you called me. And you didn't say I would die in a plane crash. My mission is not finished. My assignment is not over. We call the enemy to order and command the devil to back up. Now you pilot, you better find out where you are and take us to our destination in the name of Jesus. And he sat down. Five minutes time, the pilot said, he has made contact with Port Harcourt. Listen to this. We are supposed to be doing 30 minutes from Lagos to Benin. And the pilot, we, we landed in Port Harcourt. So we were on the, we have lost our way, we would have ended up in the sea. I will never forget. We landed in Lagos, it was still raining. Now this is where the testimony is. Mama, if was there, you can ask her. I told Papa, can I please go for bus? Because I was afraid, can we get a bus so we go to Benin? He said, no. James, you don't travel like I do. I must conquer the devil today in the air. I said, what is this? I was scared, I said, Papa, you want us to die? He said, James, if I don't conquer the devil, I will not be able to travel by air. Okada gave us his gold-plated aircraft. Chief Benedion, he called him. The plane rolled out from the hangar, and we went by air to Benin. And that Sunday evening, he made me go to church and give a testimony. He said, Ghana boy. He calls me Ghana boy. I came, he said, give them your testimony. You coward. <laughs> Another powerful miracle was when the witches in the whole world decided to come and have a meeting in Benin City. And Archbishop said, not when he's here, there won't be any such meeting. The chief priest then was summoned, his name Chief Eboho, because he was a representative of the witches then. And he said, the meeting, nobody, not even God could stop the witches from meeting. Then daddy said, or papa said, yes, God will not waste his time to stop you because I'm here to stop you. God has put me here to stop you. And guess what? That meeting never took place in Benin City. When you are with him one on one, you will feel an aura that defies definition. You know, it's as if you are in the presence of God, of a deity, of something that is beyond where you are. You know, uh, he never celebrated mediocrity. He never took no for an answer. He dared to go where nobody wants to go or everybody feared to go. He was a man that believed in venturing where others feared to venture. He was a trailblazer. I remember those days, for example, this television ministry that's becoming anything today. It also started it. In 1974-75, I'm honored to have been one of his sons. And uh, by the grace of God, I think that um, that sign wonder anointing and his boldness. I was I did a meeting for Dr. Maurice Serrillo in 2010. And just before I spoke in his world conference, 
they said uh, oh miracles don't happen in America because they have a lot of doctors it happens in the third world well when I took the microphone I just shared my testimony 23 cripples gave me their sticks and began to walk um, that kind of boldness to decree and declare I took it from the late Archbishop I believe in the transference of spirits and I believe strongly like God told Moses I will take up the spirit that is upon you and I will put it upon the 70 I'm one of the people who took of that spirit of signs and wonders from the Archbishop making a movie of the Archbishop will really really help the next generation because the young preachers and the young ministers that are coming up have no clue of who he was. It, I mean, he would still be preaching and cripples will start walking. Um, that was an awesome man of faith. I remember whilst we were in school, he went to visit and it was shown on TV. Um, we, he went to visit Kenneth Copeland and when he got there, they, he was supposed to have gone the previous day, but he arrived late. So they announced, when they announced that the Archbishop in Dahosa has arrived, six cripples got out of their wheelchairs. That is how anointed uh, Papa was. We must keep his legacy alive. Idahosa is dead to some people, but to us, to me, Idahosa lives. Hello, I am Bishop Margaret Benson Idahosa, the wife of the late Archbishop Benson Idahosa that did wonders while he was on earth here. Early in the morning when I rise, I will lift up my eyes. Now let me let you know how I got to meet him. You know, in those early years, he used to ride his bicycle with some trucks going from street to street, and one of it was my street. And every time he comes, we call him pastor. Pastor, he was young then, about 21 or 22. He was very, very young, but he didn't mind. He was not ashamed of the gospel because he knew that that was the power of God in his life. And one of these days, he was riding past, and people were crying in my house. <laughs> and he just stopped, brought his, brought his uh, small little Bible out and came in, just uh, uh, with it through the crowd. And he came and I said, ah, Pastor, please, today is not like any other day. Somebody just died. <laughs> He say, ah, I have been riding my bicycle all through. Till this time, it was about four o'clock. And I want to raise somebody. I say, he, please, I beg you. Don't, don't make a mockery of your God. He said, no, 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 no. I want to wake him up because God has told me in the book. Then he opened the book and read it that, uh, uh, Behold, I have given you power to tread upon serpents, to tread upon scorpions, and to raise the dead. And I said, listen, don't make a mockery of yourself. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal that thing. Raise the dead! I said what? I beg, wait till I talk!
Benson. You mean what you say that we can raise dead person? Yes, absolutely. Have you raised dead person before? Uh, no. Why? But you say I can do it. Yes. In the name of Jesus. Hey. He said, no, 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 come and show me where the baby was. So I said, okay. I took him to the room where the baby was lying. It, it was she. She was about uh, three years old, three or four, four years old then. And I said, "Listen, this baby died at about nine, and it's about four o'clock now. The baby is already changing color. The fa why why he why she was not being buried at this time is that the father has to go to the secretariat to get a death certificate." And he said, oh, there's no need for that now. Let's do it. Let's do it. I said, how? How are you going to do it? And he said, okay, go out if you don't want to see, see me do it. But, uh, you know, as a stubborn child, then I stood at the, I stood at the door. I stood at the door with my back laid at the door. One, one eye on this side and one eye on the front door. And he prayed. Child. Be healed. I will bring to you an offering. After he prayed, he asked me, What is the name of the child? What is the girl's name? I said, It's Inwarata. I'm a living testimony. I give God the glory for keep counting me among the living today. I'm a testimony that the whole world knows about through my father, late Ben Sinidahosa. I was sick about two weeks. After the sick, conversion hold me. So I, I, I died. When I died, they kept me inside one room. So my people was crying, weeping. About two hours, a bit three hours later, my father comes, my late Benson in the house. He said, what is happening? They told him that her daughter, their daughter has lost. They said, what happened to her? He said, she was confused. So they tried the, in the ordinary native daughter tried, they can't raise her back to life. He said, where is her now? He said, she's swallowing there. He said, he asked my father the question. He said, daddy, do you believe that the God I serve can raise him come back to life. My father said yes. So he said they should take him to the room. Then take him to where they, they lie me down. So carry me, they were praying with some of members. As they pray with God that answered by fire, hear their prayer. I come back to life. That is how I'm a living so today. And he just stretched his Bible and himself on that child and said, In water, I command you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that has empowered me to raise the dead. Now, come back to life. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, in water, I command you, rise up! I was just peeping. And all of a sudden, the, the child that died at about 9 o'clock sneezed. <laughs> and then they back to me after a year and three months in the womb. So my mother passed through many tribulations before she gave back to me. Many said, maybe I'm not a baby, I'm a wood, I'm this, but for God be thy glory. When they gave back to me, I'm, I'm a human being. And after they gave back to me, the devil, the useless man, raised up his ugly head to take my soul away. Do you know I took to my heels? 
I couldn't stand it, I couldn't wait, and I ran out. <laughs> With him to the mother. He said, Please give this child something to eat. And everybody was surprised. Everyone was shocked. Ah, and he just left. And when he left, I, I sat down and I was thinking, What is the thing that made this man to raise this child from the dead? There must be power superpower then i wasn't a child of god my mother used to serve um, she was a princess of olokun shango and all that and i said mm, the, the the power that raised this child from the dead must be a power that surpasses the power of these graven images that has no power so the father just came and we started celebrating, but he was gone. But in the night I sat and I, I started praying. I said, God, if you were the one that raised that child up, just touch me. I have been hearing messages of salvation from here and there. Even the church I, 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 I used to go then, but I just knelt down and I said, Father, let Jesus come into my heart right now. And I need to know this power that raised this child. And that was all I prayed. I didn't know how to pray salvation prayer. But I just knelt down and I said, Father, please, if you were the one that raised this child up, let come into my life and let me act and walk and believe like us. That young man that we call pastor believed, and he did this. And you know, when I finished prayer, there was an abundant joy, unspeakable joy in my spirit. And the following day, uh, we, we used to call him Brother Benson. He came and said, where is the child? We said, the child is there. And I called him to the room and I said, you know what I did last night? I did know. Uh, I, I don't know how to do it, but I just knelt by my bedside and I said, God, if you were the one that raised that child up, let me have a part of that power. I said, ah, you have done it. And I knelt down, he prayed, and I, and I said the, the sinner's prayer, and that was what got me into where I am now. And I'm glad. Okay, because I'm still alive, my father Benson Dalsa is still alive because I'm a living testimony. I'm glad that I, 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 I'm doing what I'm doing now because there was sign, there was wonder, there was, there, there was miracle that got into my heart. Thank God for today I'm alive. I have about eight children, two girls and two boys and six girls. He was a man that did everything by faith. I have about 10 grandchildren to the glory of God. Now I understand the, the type of joy. The Bible said that the joy that no man can give, that is the joy that Jesus gives when you give your life to him. You can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com
Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. Thank you for taking the time to watch this powerful video of Archbishop Benson Indaosa. Archbishop Benson Indaosa was a charismatic Pentecostal preacher. He is the founder of Church of God Mission International. Archbishop Benson Indaosa was popularly referred to as the father of Pentecostalism in Nigeria. And I'd like you to know that he was also my spiritual father please do not forget to share this video to bless all the people let this video go viral remain blessed hello this video is about Archbishop Bensi Idaosa his early Christian ministry testimony as a young Christian, I once heard my pastor say during a morning service that Christians could raise the dead in the name of the Lord Jesus. I believe it with my, all my heart. 
and flying around on my bicycle in those days, I went through the city of Benin in Nigeria in search of a dead person to raise to life. After five hours of hard searching, I found a compound where a little girl had died a few hours before. The corpse had been cleaned and prepared for burial. I walked boldly to the father of the child. The God whom I serve can bring your baby back to life. I told him, Will you permit me to pray for the child and bring her back to life? The man was startled, but he agreed. I walked into the room and up to the bed. The child was cold and dead. With strong faith in the Lord, I called on the Lord to restore the child back to life. I turned to the corpse and called it by name. Arise in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, glory to God. The corpse sneezed heavily. Alas, the child had come back to life. God is Bensi Indaosa. Now, Bensi Indaosa childhood. Bensi Indaosa was born in Benin City on September 11, 1938 to a pagan parents. He was a sickly infant who was always fainting. As a result of his constant illness, his father ordered the mother to throw him in the dustbin. When he was 18, year, 18 months old, he was left on a rubbish heap to die. He was rejected by his father, sent to work on a farm as a servant, and was denied education until he was 14 years old. His education was irregular due to the poor financial status of his parents. He later took correspondence calls from Britain and the United States while working in Bata Shoe Company. His conversion and call to ministry. His conversion was drastic and his calling supernatural. He was converted by Pastor Akos on a football field on one Sunday afternoon while playing soccer with his teammates. Thus, young Benson, young Benson became the first Benin member of Pastor Akos' small congregation. As a young convert, he became very zealous in winning souls and in conducting outreaches in villages around Benin City. He was called to the ministry in a night vision from the Lord. I have called you that you might take the gospel around the world in my name, preach the gospel, and I will confirm my words with signs following, said the voice from heaven. The room was filled with the presence of God as Benson fell to his knees before the Lord. Wherever you want me to go, I will go. He prayed through the night, renewing his vows to God and interceding for his people who were yet to hear the message of salvation. After his call, Benson launched into ministry, work preaching from village to village. The gospel of, the, of, of Jesus Christ with great power and anointing, more people confess Christ as their savior and more healings occur as he prayed for the sick. Expansion of his ministry and his credentials. Archbishop Benson Daosa, the Archbishop himself and the founder of Church of God Mission International Incorporated with his headquarters in Benin City, Nigeria established over 6,000 churches throughout Nigeria, Ghana before 90, 1971. Many of the ministers he supervised pastored churches of 1,000 to 4,000 people. In addition to filling the position of Archbishop of Church of God Mission, he, also, he, he was also president of All Nation for Christ Bible Institute, president of Idaosa World Outreach, and president of Faith Medical Center. He had positions in numerous organizations, including the College of, Bish of Bishop of the International Communion of Christian Churches and the Ora Robert uh, University in Oklahoma. He also earned a diploma in divinity from Christ for the Nation Institute in Dallas, Texas, which he attended in 1971, a doctorate of divinity in 1981, from the World Faith College, New Orleans, and 
a doctor of law degree from Ora Robot University in March 1984. He also received another degree. He also received other degrees from the International University in Brussels, Belgium. Archbishop Benson and his wife Margaret Idaosa were blessed with four children. Idaosa Supreme Tax. So winning was Idaosa primary consign with a motto Evangelism Our Supreme Tax. He worked towards his goal of reaching the Orient Nigeria, Africa, and the rest of the world with the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. As a black African, he found the doors of African countries were wide open and he ministered in over 133 countries all 123 countries all over the world. Crusade played a major role in his ministry. He was involved at least one crusade per month. A record crowd of nearly one million people a night attended his Lagos crusade in April 1985. He established the Redemption Television Ministry with a potential viewing audience of 15 million people. What leading gospel minister said about Archbishop Idaosa? According to Mrs. Gordon Frada Lisser, President of Christ for the Nation Incorporated, Dallas, Texas, USA, I know of no young black in all Africa, who is preaching, who is reaching million as Benson is, in crusade with hundreds of thousands in attendance in in, a, in his weekly nationwide telecast, in his Bible school, training eager students from several nations. He also conducted campaigns in Sweden, Singapore, Malaysia, Korea, Australia, and United States, where he often appeared on national religious telecasts. His burden for souls, his ministry of healing and miracles, even to the raising of several dead, demonstrate he is especially core of the Lord in this end time. Dr. Ben Akosa remarked, Benson Daosa is sought after by everyone in the state, from government officials to beggars. When they pose questions and explain their problem to this man, they receive instantaneous miracle solution, just as the people did in Bible days with God's prophet. The people got miraculous answer from, his, from this mighty leader of God's people, said Daniel Oris. Benin City respect and salute this great man of God even at his death. I have been with him on visit to many officials, to the governor, to the powerful Benin tribal kings. He moved with God and his people knows it. His great miracle cathedral, his headquarters sit over 10,000 in 1981. His Bible school attract upper class people from different African nations and also come from Maurice, India, uh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka. Indonesia, Singapore, Philippines, Hong Kong, Japan, Korea, the Middle East, Europe, and other nations of the world. A truly international Bible training center of dynamic faith. People know that Bishop Idaosa preached what he practiced. Dr. Idaosa evangelistic ministry has reached nations around the world. He was the first Af black African evangelist to shake Australia in a massive crusade that got national attention. His seminar have affected Christians and church leaders in many countries. I sincerely salute this man because he practiced among his own people what he preached to the world. Bensi Indaosa was a man who believed God's promises and that God's miracle provision applies to Africans as well as to Americans. He believed that Africa has a part in God's work, and Africa will reap God's blessing. Evangelist T. S. Bond from Tulsa, Oklahoma, remarked, Many who followed Idaosa's teaching have been saved from poverty and have learned to plant out of their have learned how to plant out of their desperate need and to look to God as their divine source, thereby becoming prosperous Christians in their own land. 
Ida also rose from the rank of an ordinary man to a world leader's leadership as a pastor, a builder, a counselor, a prophet, a teacher, uh, an apostle, an evangelist, a man of godly wisdom and of Christ-like compassion, whose ministry has blessed million, millions the world over. Idaosa was the greatest African ambassador of the apostolic Christian faith to the world. The secret of his success. Idaosa operated in faith. He had a robust faith. He believed and trusted God with a childlike faith. He once said that living a daily life of absolute faith in God is the only secret to great success. He believed God for everything. All things are possible to him that believes. He spent quality times in prayer and in the study of God's word. He said that if someone spent time studying the Bible and acting on it, people will come looking for that person for life solutions. He also, also spent time studying the works and the lives of other successful people, both in the gospel ministry and other faith of human endeavors. And he applied the principles he learned, he learned from these successful people to his life and ministry. He was very energetic, hardworking. One of the ministers who served under him said that he had never seen a man who worked as hard as Archbishop Benson Daosa. He was committed and consistent, and he had confidence in himself. He was very humble and full of godly wisdom. Archbishop Bensi Idaosa was said to be the leader of over 7 million Jesus people worldwide before he went to be with the Lord in February 1998. Now I'm going to talk about his early ministry again as a youth he got converted to christianity by a certain pastor Paul, and joined the flagging congregation as one of the first members he was very active and converting many to christianity after experiencing a revelation from god calling him into ministry he began to conduct outreaches from village to village before establish, establishing his church in a store in Benin City. Archbishop Benson Idaosa was well known for many notable quotable quotes, including, My God is not a poor God. Your attitude determines your your attitude determines your attitude. It is more risky not to take risk. I am a possibilitarian. A big head without a big brain is a big load to the neck. If your faith says yes, God cannot say no. Among others, many of these messages on faith, miracle, and prosperity remain a classic among Pentecostal. He had strong links with international gospel ministers like Billy Graham. T.L.S. Bond, Kenneth Hagin, Penny Inn, Ryan Bonke, Maurice Cerullo, Ora Robert, amongst others, and took the gospel to 145 nations in his lifetime. At the time of his death in 1998, he had preached to more white than any black man and to more black than any white man. His desire to meet the need of the total man led him to establish several other arms of the ministry apart from the church. They include Faith, Metaplex, All Nation for Christ Bible Institute, Word of Faith, Group of School, Bensi Indaosa University, which is currently under leadership of a son, Reverend E. F. B. Uh, Idaosa. His wife, Margaret uh, Idaosa, is the current Archbishop of the church. It was used by God to perform many miracles, including healing the blinds, raising up 28 people from the dead at different times in his ministry. You must understand this powerful man of God that God used 
to affect the nation of the world. And I'm glad and privileged that he was my father in the Lord. I am honored to be a part of his anointing, a part of his, of his ministry. I want to ask you, please make sure you share these videos, this video, this particular video to bless all the people and make sure you have enough time to visit Anointed Tube, support Anointed Tube and let people all over the world around you, your village, your town, your city, your colleagues, your family, your friends, all your contact get to know about Anointed Tube. So thank you for taking the time to listen to this or, or watch this video. I believe that um, your life can never remain the same because God's servant was such a powerful, powerful, humble, great man of God that God used before he was called to be with him. I, and I'll say it again, I am grateful and I'm privileged to be a son to Archbishop Bensi in the house. The Lord bless you.